Well, good morning, uh, everyone, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Thank you very much for joining our, our global seminar on the Amazon. We want this morning a, a pleasure to have each and every one of you. Um, I am not Shannon Marcus, who is our really the host of the uh, collaboratory this summer. Uh, Shannon is with the Columbia Undergraduate Global Engagement uh, Office, and she is uh, unfortunately indisposed this morning. So I am Tom Trebot. I'm the director of Columbia University's office in Global Center in Rio de Janeiro. I'll be the moderator of today's uh, event uh, as well. Um, so I'd like to say a few words of introduction that would have been uh, uh, Shannon uh, speaking, but on her behalf, I wanna welcome, welcome all of you uh, to the third seminar in this four part series. The next last one is going to be in a week or so, you should, you should have the date. Uh, we are inviting experts uh, who to get, came together uh, to, uh, pro to produce this magnificent volume called The Amazon We Want, a 1,400-page document involved, written by, uh, collaboratively by 200 scientists. And today we're focusing on a, a part of that past report that deals with the critical issues of land use, uh, geodiversity, climate, and demographic uh, changes in the Amazon and their impacts. So that's sort of generally what we'll be doing today, a little background on the Global Columbia Collaboratory. It takes a while to uh, get that name down, but it's been a very useful concept for us at Columbia University. The Undergraduate Global Engagement Office at Columbia in partnership with uh, Columbia Global Centers and Columbia World Projects launched these collaboratories in the midst of the pandemic in May 2020 to support our students around the world in those very trying and difficult circumstances. The collaboratory continues uh, today uh, to bring students, thought leaders, and educators together, promotes cross-cultural communication, enhances skills and global competence to allow Columbia students and students from other universities to reflect, to ideate, uh, create ideas together, and to collaborate to empower them to make a difference in the world and start thinking of solutions because the world is really literally in their hands. Uh, students uh, have participated in these uh, laboratories from over 36 countries around the world. And this summer, we have 48 students uh, enrolled in the collaboratory on the Amazon. They represent no fewer than 16 countries representing 10, and represent 10 enrollments at 10 universities. They're tuning in this morning. And please say hello, if you will, of those of you joining us online. They're tuning in for, uh, this morning, this evening uh, from Asia. Of Europe, the Americas, uh, cities such as New York, Mumbai, Bogota, Tel Aviv, Hamburg, just to just to name a few. So, a truly a global audience. Um, uh, it, it, they use smartphones and laptops to access the collaboratory virtual exchange platform, uh, and students form a community of global thinkers and problem solvers through participation in themed global seminars featuring inter international speakers, such as the three wonderful speakers that we have today. Um, as learnings and perspectives are shared across the collaboratory, students from project teams then tackle specific global issues. So this is more than just an academic experience. They, they come together, they tackle specific global issues and topics of interest. And the collaboratory serves ideally, and I think actually in, in practice, as an incubator for bringing ideas into reality and promoting new projects and innovative, innovative solutions for global challenges. Well, we're thrilled that undergraduate students from all over the world have been involved in the collaboratory every semester since it was launched in 2020. And as I said at the beginning, uh, the program continues with this uh, very important focus on the Amazon we want. Uh, I'll make just a, a word or two, and then I'll, then I'll proceed to our, our uh, webinar as such. Uh, a word or two of housekeeping. There is a Q&A uh, function. Please use it. We have a number of, of questions the students have already submitted. Um, maybe others will pop up in the, uh, in the Q&A. Um, and then also there is a trans, an interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So it is available uh, in, uh, in Portuguese uh, as well. And I'll remind you we're live streaming on, uh, on YouTube as well this morning. So let me then um, turn uh, and thank our partners for helping us put this together. I know Shannon would want me to do that. And, would be remiss in not mentioning that the partnership with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, truly they've been a guiding force in putting together this collaboratory and of course the science panel for the Amazon whose uh, authors have contributed to this magnificent volume. It truly takes a village 
uh, to produce what we're doing today. And we're grateful to everybody who's been part of that. Let me then turn uh, substantively now uh, with that introduction uh, to the collaboratory. Let me turn substantively to our, uh, our comments this morning. Uh, this part uh, of the uh, SBA report uh, deals uh, with land use, climate, and demographic change in the Amazon. The authors tell us in their study that the Amazon has been treated as an experimental laboratory for modernization and development policies and politics since at least uh, the end of World War II. Many of these uh, policies uh, and politics have had disastrous effects. I don't think that's too strong a word on peoples, forests, and aquatic systems of the Amazon. And as we increasingly know and note with great alarm on the planet as a whole, this session presents the major ideas, actors, and practices that have shaped the Amazon's current development and deforestation dynamics. It highlights how Amazonians have continuously adopted, uh, adapted to changing circumstances while fighting to advance their own proposals for conservation and equity in development remains a distant goal, but one we all must aim for. Uh, our three speakers briefly, I'll introduce them in, in turn as they speak, but just to mention their names at the outset, uh, Susanna Heck, uh, Erica Berenger, and uh, Marina Hirota uh, will be our three speakers. They've each got uh, 12 to 15 minutes of initial product, uh, presentations. They'll have slides to, uh, to accompany their remarks. Uh, I'm going to introduce you, Susanna, and go to you first. Uh, uh, Professor Susanna Hecht joins us from the UCLA School uh, of Public Policy and, and the Graduate Institute for Development Studies in Geneva. So two very distinguished institutions. She earned her PhD in geography from the University of California at Berkeley, studying the soil impacts of forest conversion to pasture in Amazonia. We haven't, we're only now dealing with the, the long-term consequences of that. Uh, Dr. Heck Susanna has worked in the Amazonian livestock, non-timber forest products, uh, and uh, in indigenous knowledge on the expansion of soy in Brazil and Bolivia and clandestine economies in Colombia. And uh, more generally, Susanna has uh, provided many studies on Amazonian development, its environmental history, and humanized landscapes of the tropics. So, uh, Professor Heck Susanna, welcome very much to the collaboratory. The, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I have a lot of slides. So what I thought I would do is rather than um, uh, do much by way of introduction to go right to my screen. So hang on everybody. We're just gonna go into that share screen thing. I know we all are used to this. Let's see, come on, let's open. Should, okay, we're gonna share, blump. Here we go. I'm going to turn this into, um, here we go, into a slideshow. And there we go. Okay, I, I, I always checking, can you see my screen? Someone raised their thumb. Okay, good. Thank you, Erica. All right, so um, let me, uh, first of all, uh, mention a couple of things about Amazonia. I'm going to, uh, one is that it's often perceived as a place, a uh, land without history. Uh, it has an extremely complex history and in the discoveries of the last uh, decades on the archaeology, it's completely turned around our understanding of this place as a uh, in many ways, a cradle of tropical civilizations with uh, extensive urban systems, extensive production and ceremonial systems, and extraordinary engineering works. As you can see in this um, in this slide, this is uh, what we call a geoglyph. It's actually uh, a sort of ceremonial site, and also you can see the straight lines. The orange line that is running against it there is a modern road, but you can see that there's a lot of connectivity and there was a great deal of connectivity using both land and water systems between these massive urban areas. So one of the things is that um, you can't imagine that uh, nothing has happened there, uh, quite a bit has happened there. Also, it's been inter in, interlinked to large scale circuits of trade, linguistics, um, and politics for centuries. 
so that the dynamics that we're seeing here have many deep roots. Um, well, this is, uh, uh, um, I'm just a quick question. Are you seeing the whole slide here or just is it truncated? No? Okay, it's, uh, I can't hear what, uh, well, Hold it looked on. okay. It looks okay. All right. Because yep, yep. I, 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 okay. Thank you, er, Erica. I rely on you to just give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. So one of the things that I, uh, we know that the Amazonian Anthropocene began around 15,000 years ago and probably more. So we know that it's had a long history of impact, just like what I've been saying. But what it hasn't had, although it has had the use of fire, is what we might see is the change from Amazonian's Anthropocene to what Stephen Pine calls the Pyrocene, the age of fire. And what this gives you a sense of is that how climate change, extreme events are enhancing forest instabilities. The, there are also a lot, a lot of social factors that I will be discussing, but that we're starting to see a real structural shift. And I know that there will be much more discussion on this by my colleagues. So I'm not gonna go over it, but what you wanna get a sense of is how dramatic the use of fire is, and that the more you use it, you really can't necessarily, it starts to have its own positive feedbacks and has its own dynamics and hence the age of fire, just like we had ice ages. Um, one of the things that you probably know about deforestation, if you've read You Poor Lambs Having to Plow Your Way Through That Report, um, is that we know that uh, Amazonian deforestation rates although rates of degradation and also what's called leakage did not stop, but Amazonian deforestation really did decline by 80% between 2004 and 2012. It's now very much on the way up and uh, with very high rates of increasing deforestation. So one of the things that's interesting about that is that one does know that it is possible to change these dynamics. Now, um, what you see here is a bunch of policy, um, a, a bunch of policy dynamics that we have tracked on to uh, also different kinds of uh, uh, political regimes at the time and different kinds of instabilities. And of course, what you see now is um, the rise of, of uh, a completely different policy framework and one that's kind of dominated by a sort of jungle capitalism, if you will, with, uh, with little um, um, regulation. The uh, Lula regime was often considered the uh, era of sociobiology. It involved thinking about forests as inhabited areas and uh, with a strong regulatory apparatus, even though you had a lot of uh, a, a growing and expanding population into Amazonia, you didn't have these deforestation dynamics. If you've read the chapter, you, it goes through this in like crushing detail, sorry. Um, what's important to keep in mind is that you really did have a, a major structural change, a major what we might call socio-environmental tipping point with the new constitution in 1988. I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail, but the creation of new institutionalities, new laws, different kinds, what I call the three greens, the environmental, mar ecological markets, the uh, environmental markets, payment for environmental services, and also new forms of governance, the green governance. So that goes into different kinds of international things new kinds of property regimes, new kinds of social alliances to manage these landscapes. So it's a lot of the stuff that comes into play. And we can think of this really truly as a kind of a tipping point away from the period that preceded it in the military, uh, the previous military thing that went on for about, a, that began in 1964. And, um, sort of uh, launched a lot of the dynamics of deforestation that caused uh, the global uh, concern. There were other things that went on there that have to do with the sort of larger period of 1988 as a tipping point, IPCC, end of the Soviet Union, 
et cetera, et cetera, in creation of the internet. Anyway, there's a lot that went on there. It really changed the dynamic. But um, what you see were a complex of politics and social movements. This responds to one of the questions, many new institutionalities and a completely novel conservation strategy based on the idea of inhabited environments, sociality, territorial alliances, and as I mentioned, the three greens, markets, enviro, and governance regimes. Um, but what we have uh, occurring in 2019 is a, what we call in the social sciences a natural experiment, which is you have everything in place and then you remove it and then what happens? So what you have here um, is no more demarcation, new demarcation and categorization of Amazonia itself. Um, now total shifts in protected areas, a different kind of indigenous policy, Indians wanna be people, degazetting of conservation areas, a huge amnesty for cleared areas, um, uh, gutting environmental institutions, cutting scientific institutions, a uh, massive uh, uh, firing and um, of uh, directors and personnel within those uh, institutions and undermining the, the what we might call the monitoring system. So what happens with that? Well, of course you get the, um, the, the, the differential dynamics, but it's important to keep in mind that these are also taking place within the context of other kinds of things, which we might call failing states or flailing states. We're coming to the end of the so-called modernization model, the ISI model and so on and these economies are stuttering along. Within that context, you get also an emergence of clandestine economies as capacities of states decline and their interest in it declines. It's useful to think of Amazonia as an internal colony. It's nine countries and most of what you read about them will go along sort of the edges. It'll go along where the capital cities are, but the dynamics of its relation to Amazonia and remember, many of these countries have 60 to 70% of their national territory in Amazonia. It's treated like an internal colony, internal colony in which those who inhabit these areas have very little determined ability to determine their own autonomy. There's also historic levels of inequality and in racialized politics. So the result of that is the dynamics are always unfolding in these very uneven ways. The other thing is Amazonia itself and Erica and um, Marina will be discussing that. The other thing is that there's just been a failure of the development programs in a lot of ways. You may have been able to raise up some human development indices, but overall it's a deindustrialization in the development model and a shift to extraction of raw materials. Once you start down that, it's very difficult to uh, change. The other is the uh, rise of China as the main trading partner and main investment partner, new forms of financial and financialization and globalization, and the rise of urban urbanization and uh, high levels of employment precarity. So that means that you just don't know how your income is being formed. I'm going to go through, I'm really very quickly, just a few issues about uh, land use change. As many of you know, livestock is the largest land use. It has a function not just to produce cattle. In fact, one could argue that its real function is to produce an asset, a landed asset that becomes important in speculation. Those of you who follow um, Thomas Piketty will know that assets increase in value faster than the rate of growth. So in a certain sense that what you see is not just a land rush, but an asset rush. Um, logics of livestock are complicated. There's tons of institutional support. It's a flexible system. It's great for laundering other illegal things. It's got relatively low entry costs. You don't have to buy like massive amounts of machinery. It's low labor and it's kind of a settled technology. 
it has also the iconography of class and so on around livestock. And it's become a major, it's now has major export markets. Um, most of those export markets are not going to be vulnerable to the levers that you have in the EU. So the main, um, they're Asian markets and Middle Eastern markets. The other major dynamic that we're seeing now, which is absolutely explosive is gold mining and mining more generally. This is sort of uh, labor intensive. This has started to become an important labor opportunity along with uh, it's, it, a large portion of it is illegal. It's one of the big uh, clandestine things. So if you want to think about clandestine economy, the land grabbing through livestock, the uh, extraction of gold and gold launders really easily. You just put it in you. Th this moment of pulling it out of the ground is the one moment where it has a kind of illegal life, it moves very quickly into legalized cir uh, circuits and very soon finds itself um, in Swiss markets where it's widely exchanged as a legal commodity. Um, the mining incursions, of course, have major effects on, um, on uh, indigenous areas. And you can see, of course, that uh, the rise of mining areas has increased enormously in the last 20 years. Um, most of it, again, is illegal, and I'm just going to zoom through. But there's also Saudi Amazonia, which is that don't think that there isn't a lot of legal mining um, or legal extraction going along with oil extraction. This is, of course, the Solimoy sedimentary basin, but you know that there are um, major deposits along the Andean, the Andean Trench going from Bolivia, Ecuador, into Colombia and then of course over into Venezuela and in the Guyanas, one of the largest finds ever in offshore oil. So we're now looking at uh, a, major, a major dynamic and if any country, any resource represents the resource curse, it is as they say, the oil curse. I'm almost done here. So here's um, soybeans. Um, Again, these are, uh, uh, this is a, a legal product, but often associated with illegal land grabs. Again, I'm just sort of pointing to its dynamics. It's got a huge international market. With the Ukrainian situation, we can expect this expansion and this year to be much greater as oil crops um, have more than tripled their value in the last half year. Well, the newspapers have been full of this. I'm sure you've been following this, which is Dom Phillips and Bruno Pereira, um, who were murdered about two weeks ago uh, in the Havari. Now this is, um, uh, or the Javari, as we would say it in Portuguese. Now this region has been in contest for a, since 1755. So the idea that somehow this is a remote thing where no one, the wild Indians inhabit it. It was also the center of the rubber boom. It's been centered of gold booms forever. And if you look at the archeology, span this area has been extraordinarily intensively inhabited for a long time. But anyway, if part of this iconography about Amaz the lost world of Amazonia into the remote Havari, it's only remote in the sense th that um, uh, uh, clandestine economies make it difficult to get to, yeah. but it is a place that is run by them. I can see that I Tom is looking at me. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So uh, I'm just going to say vi a little word about violence, which is, um, as you might recall from Casablanca, there's that moment of, I'm so shocked that there's violence, that indigenous people and journalists are being killed. Why this has never happened about. Uh, yeah. I, I would just point out that it's banal and usual. Meanwhile, while everyone's focusing on this, Ecuador is having a major indigenous uprising um, that may overthrow the national government. Um, so I put this on as like the hippo-like yawn in most circles about killing indigenous and journalists, um, however important they are structurally, um, they remain very important, but less, um, less uh, perhaps impactful at this particular moment than Chico Mendes, who gave rise to a lot of the socio-environmental movements. 
Dorothy Stang, who also worked on land rights in the Trans-Amazon, and of course, recent forest defenders. So um, this is my last slide, which is Minerva's owls fly at dusk. So what that means is we'll find out what the larger impacts are. My colleagues will tell you more explicitly, but what I have just tried to do in this really short overview is give you a sense of some of the processes. So um, uh, I always like to end quoting my favorite Amazonian author, Euclides da Cunha, who always says about Amazonia, such is, it, such is the river, such as it is its history, always turbulent, always insurgent. So with that, I'm going to shut up. So um, I'm going to stop my share. Boom. Okay, just want, here I am. I just want you to rest your voice for a little while because you've got questions to answer at the end of the other presentations. But that was a terrific overview, Susanna. Thank you very, very much. And a thank you at the very end for um, raising the memory of the martyrs uh, 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 of, the, of the forest. Uh, and the aquatic systems of the Amazon. Uh, we'd like to think this is partly dedicated to the memory of Dom uh, Phillips and Bruno Pereira in part. But the, the point I, I've tried to make, and I'm not certain it's the right one to make with the students, is that people get killed for uh, 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 revealing the kinds of truths that this science, uh, your, your work as scientist is, is, uh, is doing. People don't like this. It, it, it affects, uh, as you've pointed out very well, very, very powerful economic interests. And, Makes one a little discouraged about the, op, uh, the options for the future, Susanna. So maybe we'll get into that about alternative models of development and the powerful force, economic forces keeping the status quo. Maybe we'll come back to you for that in the, in the, in the comments. But let me move, let me <laughs> back to my function here, which is to introduce such great speakers, Erica, Erica, Professor Erica Berenger joins us today from uh, Oxford University in the, in the UK. She's originally Brazilian. Uh, has her PhD from Lancaster University, also in the uh, uh, in the UK, and she studied this fascinating topic of degradation of Amazonian forests, uh, specifically looking at different types of anthropogenic disturbances on carbon stocks and plant diversity uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. Something we newcomers only now cottoning onto us to its importance. Uh, Dr. Berenger Eric is also one of the coordinators of. Of the Ahegi Amazonia Stinktavio, which is a large research network focused on human modified uh, landscapes. And I might say that the Science Panel for the Amazon is sort of an example of scientists from everywhere, institutions all over the world coming together in, productive, in, in a productive way. So maybe a remark or two later on from you, Erica, on, on, uh, uh, on the Ahegi, that network, and how it works with these. So, of interest to our students. But Erica, thank you very, very much for being with us and the, the floor is now yours. Hopefully I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> this is more happiness of life. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. Let's see if this is gonna work. I know it's gonna be. That's what your voice sounds like. <laughs> um, share screen, share screen, share screen. And is it? Yep, yep. Here it is. Got it. Okay, so well, that's great. So after the drama of nothing working ever since working, so that's really good. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Susanna, for this brilliant. Um, in, I think it's such a great talk to come before mine because now I come with the boring numbers, but you gave the processes and I think they fit super well. And thank you also for. Um, Raising the point about environmental defenders, we are also raw about Dom and Bruno, and we don't discuss enough the history of murdering in the region and how it's been increasing, and how between 60 to 70 percent of all environmental defenders killed in the world are actually killed in Latin America, especially in the Amazon, not only the Brazilian Amazon, but especially in the Amazon. So I want to talk about, ooh, it's not changing my slides. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Um, Yes, okay. So when you talk about deforestation, Susanna was talking a lot about it, we tend to see photos like this, which on the left, you have the forest standing, on the right, you have the forest on the ground. It has recently been bulldozed when we took this photo. You can see the actual trees on the ground. So deforestation is a binary process. You either have the forest or you don't have the forest. I'm gonna zoom in 
a little bit on the forested area, and you can see how it looks on the ground. You can see that this is a very, uh, this photo was just um, days after it was bulldozed. That's why you can see the trees is still green laying on the ground. But this is a very, very important issue in the Amazon because up to 2018, 870,000 square kilometers have been deforested. Those are the areas in um, orange in the map. In green are the areas of the biome that are still standing. But I do understand that that number is quite abstract. The human mind has problems with very large numbers or very small numbers. So to give a perspective for those of you that are in Brazil, that's about 20 times the size of Rio de Janeiro that have been deforested up to 2018. <clears throat> for those in the UK like me, it's about 3.6 times the area of the UK that has been deforested. In total, the Amazon biome has lost about 14% of its original forest cover. But as you can see in the map, um, forest loss, deforestation is not homogeneous across the space. It's concentrated in certain areas, in particularly in the Brazilian Amazon. And Brazil has deforested an area 15 times larger than the second country the most deforested in the Amazon, which is Peru. Of course, most of the Amazon is inside of Brazil, so that's not that surprising that Brazil is the largest forest, but the amount, the degree of magnitude of how higher, how much greater forest loss in Brazil is what I want to bring the attention here. Um, most of the deforestation in the Amazon is due to agricultural expansion, and that due to demand for primary commodities both within um, the Amazon and country, so domestic demand, but also demand for export, which was something that Susanna brought before. And within agricultural expansion, it's really important to focus on cattle ranching, which is the main driver of deforestation across Amazonia. Just in Brazil, 80% of the areas already deforested are occupied by cattle ranching, which links very well to what Susanna was talking about assets, about securing land by putting some cattle is very low maintenance. There's a few other drivers of deforestation of lower um, <clears throat> that occupy lower amounts of land, but are also important. Like for example, soybeans, which are important in Brazil and Bolivia, and palm oil, which is important in Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador in driving deforestation. But the area that they contribute to the forest every year is much smaller than the area that is deforested for cattle ranching. And this is important because often we hear as if Soy is the only driver of deforestation, the main driver of deforestation. It is an important driver, but cattle ranching by far is the most important driver of deforestation across the basin. The three countries that deforest the least in the Amazon, which is Guyana, French Guyana, and Suriname, are actually not their main driver of deforestation, is not agricultural expansion is gold mining, which Susanna also mentioned, and, and mentioned also the links to the export markets, which is vital here. You need demand for those commodities. But there are impacts of deforestation that you often talk about, and they change in scale. We have local impacts, for example. If we compare this area here with forest, with the area on the side that has been deforested, the area that has been deforested on the right has already seen an increase of one to three degrees of um, surface temperature. So it's hotter in areas that have been deforested. But also at the landscape scale. The landscape scale, I'm talking about landscapes that are about 100 square kilometers. And if you compare a landscape with a lot of forest patches with another landscape with much less forest patches, we are going to see that the ones with less forest is about three degrees hotter than the areas that have more forest as a whole. It's not only temperature, precipitation is also, um, it's also highly affected in Amazonia. And that's because between 25 and 50% of the moisture in Amazon of the rainfall is recycled rain through evapotranspiration. So that basically means the more forest you have, the more moisture is being recycled by the trees, the less forest you have, the less precipitation you are gonna have. Across Amazonia, it's estimated that we already have 19% less 
rainfall. And that's really important because it has direct social and economical impacts. In this paper last year, um, the authors on the, on the top map um, estimated the amount of forest loss by each grid cell. So the darker the little square, um, the more forest loss, the more deforested is the grid cell. On the bottom map, the darker the grid cell, the greatest the reduction in precipitation, the less rainfall that grid cell is seeing. The authors then projected how this region of the Amazon, this is the Southern Brazilian Amazon, how this would look like in 2050 in a scenario of low governance. And a scenario of low governance is exactly the end of Susanna's on top when she was talking about no law enforcement, destruction of existing institutions, etc. And that's how it's going to look like. The top map shows how it's estimated for a lot forest loss to be in um, southern Brazilian Amazon by 2050, while the bottom map shows the amount of precipitation reduction. You can see there's a lot of reduction in rainfall, and that impacts directly agriculture in the region. And that's because agriculture in the region is not irrigated. It's a rainforest, it rains a lot. But when we have this reduction in precipitation, agricultural yields are gonna be substantially smaller than they are today. And the authors estimate um, that actually profits are gonna be reduced by $1 billion by 2050. I mean, annually, annually it's gonna decrease $1 billion just in agricultural production in the region. There's also an impact, not only region, but continental. If you look at the La Plata Basin, which is uh, occupies Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, um, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And this is a very important river basin because in it, we have large hydro dams that actually supply electricity to cities like Rio and Sao Paulo. So the big industrial cities of Brazil, 70% um, of the rainfall in that river basin comes from the Amazon comes from water recycled in Amazon. So if we don't have the forest, we don't have moisture being recycled, so we don't have that moisture reaching the La Plata Basin, which can lead, for example, to electricity crisis, to energy crisis across the largest Brazilian cities. And I have the bias of talking too much about Brazil as a Brazilian, but of course, this is gonna have impacts on all the other countries. Like for example, Uruguay is completely inside the La Plata Basin. Imagine the impact that this will have have in terms of water supplies and electricity supplies to Uruguay. Oops. Yes. And of course, the impact that we talk the most is greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions. And I want to explain how that happens in the process of deforestation. When you chop down the forest, when you bulldoze down the forest, like I showed in the previous slide, you waited for that forest, that down forest, to dry for several weeks till it's lit on fire. And literally, that down vegetation is turning to smoke, thus the greenhouse gas emissions. That's a, far, that's a photo that I took in November 2019. And you can see that the fire didn't catch it very well because you can still see on the ground some of the trunks that didn't burn. But you can see the ashes, you can see the charcoal, you can see this process that I just spoke about down in the forest and then lighting on fire. And that's what sends all those greenhouse gas emissions. If you think about that a hectare of Amazon and forest stores about th uh, 300 tons of carbon. Now, if you imagine the 10,000 square kilometers of being deforested every year, you can see the amount of CO2 that we are putting in the atmosphere. And that's what makes Brazil the sixth largest um, emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. Brazil is one of the top emitters in the world, and that's mainly due to deforestation. 66% of Brazilian emissions are due to land use change, are due to deforestation. But that can be seen as an opportunity. Perhaps it's easier to decrease deforestation, as Susanna shown that it has happened before in the Lula government, than it is to change the whole energy supply chains of Europe, for example, which is completely based on, on fossil fuels. So maybe that's a low hanging fruit. It's an opportunity for us to quickly decrease greenhouse gas emissions. But I've been talking about this binary system, having a forest or not having a forest. But now I'm gonna talk about the forests that are still standing and what is happening to those forests. <clears throat> So this is what I showed before, deforestation. Now I'm gonna talk about forest degradation. The forest on the left, this photo was taken two years after it burned and it's a set of protected area. The forest on the right, 
I took this photo seven years after it burned and two years after it was selective logged. And you can see how different they are. You can see there's a whole spectrum here of degraded forests. It's not binary as it is the case with, um, with deforestation. So it's clearly important to define what forest degradation is when it can look so different. So forest degradation is the overall reduction of the ability of a forest to provide goods and services. And that's really important to understand that forest degradation is the outcome of a disturbance. Forest degradation doesn't cause anything. Forest degradation is the result of something. And that's really important to bear in mind for the, for the rest of my talk. And forest degradation has um, um, several things that can influence how much a forest and uh, has its, its ability to provide goods and service reduced. One of it is the disturbance type. For example, forest fires. It's really important to notice the fires don't naturally occur in the Amazon. It's not like Californian for, um, forests, like for example, or savannas. The Amazon's a rainforest. It didn't quiver over fire. So I'm gonna talk more about this in a little bit. Edge effects, so effects that happen on the on the border between a forest and a man-made edge. What is going on there? That's a, a, a disturbance that causes a lot of degradation in the forest and also selective logging. But those disturbances don't occur separately. They can occur together. Like this is a forest fragment <coughs> that doesn't exist anymore, but it used to exist. I used to pass in front of it several times a year. And this forest fragment was quite small, suffering from edge effects that I showed before. It has been selective logged, so the big trees have been removed in the past. And I've seen it burning three times. Those are the ones that I've seen. This is completely not anecdotal. I did a map to see. And then I catch a remote sensing data to see how many times this, this forest fragment burned. But you can see how degraded it is. It barely look like a forest after the soil. This is the soil on the front. It barely look like a forest, but that has never been clear cut. That's just the effect of multiple disturbances happening frequently and in combination. We also have disturbance intensity. For example, if a forest selective log, how many trees do you remove that? How that's gonna affect the ability of a forest to supply goods and services. Like for example, did we remove three trees in a hectare, five, seven? Another important point is the disturbance frequency. I like just show a photo that illustrates that the frequency of disturbance is important, but to illustrate a forest that burns once loses about 60% of its large stems, which a forest that burns twice loses about 80% of its stems. So the frequency of disturbance is going to impact how degraded a forest becomes. And finally, we have the time since disturbance. It's also going to affect the ability of a forest to supply goods and services. And for this, I, I use the photos that uh, I had before. Like in the left, you can see a forest that burned two years before the photo, but on the right is a photo of a forest that burned seven years. Um, and you can see how different those forests are, how their ability to supply goods and services have changed. Now for the very <coughs> for the end of my talk, I'm gonna focus on disturbance type. And this paper by Bullock in 2020 shows that about 1 million square kilometers of Amazonian forests have been degraded to date. Those are the areas in blue. I know this map's a bit small, but those are the areas in blue. Those are the areas degraded. So basically we have a larger area of degraded forests in Amazonia than of the forested lands. To give a perspective, that's about 23 times the area of the state of Rio and about six times the area of the UK. Of all the Amazon forest is still standing, that it still exist, about 17% of those are degraded. And here comes a really important point that I really want you guys to, to take away as a take home message, which is there's a common mistake that says, well, but the greater forests, they're just gonna be deforested later. We don't really need to worry about them or the emissions. And this is just not true. Only 14% of the forests that were degraded between 95 and 2017 were later deforested. So most of these forests that are degraded, they keep standing. And we need to think about ways to preserve them as they still have important roles in carbon storage, biodiverse maintenance. So it's really important to think about ways to facilitate recovery and to keep them standing. Um, just to illustrate how degradation, uh, um, um, 
how this servants can affect the ability of a forest to supply goods and services. And we can see on the left, an undisturbed forest, the amount of carbon that it stores, that's what it's on the y-axis. Logged forests store substantial less carbon. And forests that have been logged and burned, which is the LBF, they store about 40% less carbon than an undisturbed forests. So there's a great reduction in that supply of goods. Using a different study, um, if we look at each line is a forest and this, the arrow show where fire happened. And these plots are plots that we've been following since 2010 and 2015 and the big El Nino, they got on fire. And which is the, the arrow, right? So if we look at this particular plot here, we can see and then in just six months since the fire, it lost 40% of its trees. The y-axis shows excess mortality. So the amount of trees that are dying that are above the baseline, that are above what normally dies in that period of time. It's a metric that was um, 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 widespread, it was very widespread during COVID that we're all always talking about excess mortality. So in just six months, we have 40% of the trees in this plot dying above baseline. Oh. In the other six months, we had another 20%. Oh, I'm, I have to finish. Is that it? Uh, if you could, Derek, it's wonderful. But if you could wrap up and we'll have... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to be really quick. Okay. So just to say right. that mortality remained above baseline levels after a fire for two and a half years. So we continue to see true mortality, which leads to this um, loss in carbon that I just explained on the, on the plot in the left. Right. This is really important. Because if you look at this paper from Celso Silva Jr., we have in green the amount of um, emissions coming um, as a result of forest degradation. In, sorry, in green is a result of deforestation, in pink of degradation. And you can see that often in a year basis, we have a greater emission coming from degradation than deforestation. And my last slide is that these forests often wow. they don't recover. In this other paper, we analyze forests that burn, forests that didn't burn, and mm. 30 years after a fire, you can see the forests still store 25% less carbon. I had a few videos that I'm not going to show to you guys, but how I want to finish this talk, which is quite doom and gloom, is just asking you yeah. if we see that um, one th two thirds of the Amazon are going to become a drier up to 2050. That's what climate projections do. Yeah. Fires are going to become more common. So is this the new, the new normal for the Amazon forest yeah. like this? And I think that's something really important for us to discuss in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. It was wonderful to hear you and a great relief to have you, uh, the, the, the video and the, and the audio working well. We have has had a, a few nervous moments, but thank you so much for that, which tied in nicely to what Susanna told us. And I'm thinking, Susanna, you know, there, there we have a, a common conception that this is this green blob on the map, it's kind of all the same, but you both help us understand that you need to look much more carefully at what's happening. And uh, I want to thank you very much for bringing us up to speed on, or a little, a little more up to speed on degradation, really what it is, and its long-term consequences, which are very alarming. It isn't a matter of like, okay, now we sit back and it'll regrow and it'll eventually it'll be okay. It, that's not the case. Then both of you have mentioned too, I think uh, uh, Susanna referred to it as bovine colonialism. Um, kind of, we're all we're all guilty of this, right? It's almost lunch hour here in Brazil, and a lot of people will be having hamburgers and so forth and steaks for lunch. And kind of, we're all part of that, aren't we? That that uh, that industry. So maybe when we come to the Q and A, because uh, we want to hear from Marina first, we'll talk about ESG considerations. Whether the big meatpacking companies, how much are they to blame? How much are consumers to blame? And apart from who gets most of the blame, what do we do about that? Why is the world's driving uh, a, a, a desire for more and more animal protein? Uh, what can we do about that? Because the longer term consequences of, of the, the expansion of cattle ranching are, are very dramatic. So thank you very, very much. I made a little longer summary about that than I wanted to, but uh, give me just some ideas so we can come back to in the Q&A. But not before hearing from Professor Marina Irota, Marina, uh, good morning to you. Uh, Marina is an assistant professor of meteorology at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in the south of Brazil. Uh, she has a very diverse uh, academic background in math, computer engineering, and a PhD in meteorology from Brazil's renowned uh, uh, National Institute for Space Research, INPE. 
Uh, her current uh, research is uh, on earth uh, system sciences uh, and uh, more specifically trying to understand processes and, and, and interactions involved in biome shifts uh, within tropical zones uh, of, the, of the planet. Dr. Irota is particularly focused on searching for synergistic, I have to practice some of these words, synergistic mechanisms within the atmosphere and, and the biosphere to deepen the scientific basis for tipping points. So here we are considering really head on this issue of tipping points and forest dieback as sort of a permanent condition uh, after a certain point, how worried should we be about that? So she's deep in the scientific basis for, science, for tipping points in South American tropical ecosystems and their planetary effects, which is something maybe she'll tell us more about the planetary effects as well as the regional ones. Marina, thank you very, very much for, for being with us this morning. Yeah, hi. hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm going to um, share my screen now. Uh, just to see if it works. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Does it work? Yes, Can it see it? Yes, yes, it did. Super. Okay, just a second. Just it was in the last. Getting us right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then put it in presentation mode. Yeah. Because I was in the last slide. I'm sorry. And hi. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Is it? Is it visible? Yes, but it's not in the modo presentation. You can put it in the bottom there, I think. And oh, no. Right there, down there. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the mode, but it's not, apparently it's not going. Is it? Well, no, we can go, for, go do it just the way it is. That's it, fine. <laughs> no, just a oh. um, Yeah. Sorry. I thought this only happened to me. <laughs> no, with Zoom, I always make uh, yeah, I always make me I always make mistakes. All right, can you can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Is it big? It's oh, not it's whole screen. screen. But that's so weird. Um, it's okay though, we can see it. I, I would suggest we just yeah? proceed. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So um, what I'm talking today with you all um, will be about um, a zoom out of what Susanna and Erica just said. They did a great job. So my job here will be a lot easier, I guess. Um, so just to illustrate that, um, it's important to see that Amazonia is a two-way path. Uh, two -way path and the global climate um, in general for, for the planet. So what we have here is like the Amazon influencing the whole planet and the planet also influencing the regional climate within the Amazon. So, um, just a second. I'm, so, I'm so sorry, this thing is not really working. Yeah, okay. So climate change is impacting dry season lands and extreme events like droughts and flooding events in the Amazon. And in return, not in return, but as a feedback here or fitting the feedback, we have deforestation, fires and land use in the Amazon affecting uh, local climate, landscape climate and the global climate as Erica already mentioned. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is this part here because Erica and Susanna already covered a little bit of deforestation fires and land use and how it's affecting the Amazon. But this interaction here is supposed to, uh, theoretically, is supposed to um, stay in equi equilibrium um, and sustain the world and the planet as it is today, right? Not only the Amazon, but the other ecosystems around the world in general. Okay, can you see it? Mm. Yeah? Did it you think you need to advance the slide, Marina. Um, We're still so seeing the first slide. In my... There you go. Okay, now we... Yeah, climate okay. has been changing within the Amazon limits. Uh, I'm very sorry. I don't know why. Okay. 
So, um, in here, just to show how climate has been changing within the Amazon and has been changing for the past 40 years. Uh, we see here in Northwestern Amazon that the temperature is increasing and the rainfall is increasing, not decreasing. And um, the flooding events are also increasing. So it's more rain here. Um, in contrast to that, we see Southern Amazon, and Erica showed results on Southern, Southern Amazon of decreasing precipitation, and in, it's indeed decreasing. Temperature here is increasing, and drought events with extreme drought are also increasing. And in Central, Northeastern, and Eastern Amazon, we see um, a different pattern as well. So you see rainfall not, not changing, um, like significantly, temperature increases, and this is very in agreement with other regions as well. And then we have drought and flood um, increasing, in an extreme rainfall also increasing. So you see, it's like a mosaic of different trends um, in climate variables for the Amazon, and what's going to happen, right? How is regional climate? are enforcing changes that we already see on the ground. And here, it's uh, just an illustration in Southern Amazon, how dry season length is increasing. So if you can see that, right? Uh, and I hope you can. Um, this yellow line here. So here I, we have wet season on the, the left side, dry season, or wet season on the left side, and in the middle, the dry season length. So in here, we have January to December in the x-axis, and we see that in yellow here, the length of the dry season is increasing. And why is that important? Just because after the dry season, plants are supposed to be more stressed already. So it's different if um, the onset of the dry season begins earlier or if it uh, lasts longer. So lasting longer is is worse, right, for plants in general. So the onset of the rainy season is delayed in about 15 days in Southern Amazon. And this is increasing with time, but we don't know yet. But this is already seen and observed in the Amazon, right? Plus deforestation and plus increasing fires that we saw in the presentation from Erica and Susanna, what is going to happen with vegetation? So just to give you an example of dry season impact. And then if you see in red here are the regions where seasonality, so the, the intensity of seasonality in the Amazon is increasing, so which, me, which means that you have a season or a dry season more intense than in general. So there's a trend in that and the weather the more intense it's becoming. So dry season intensification is, or it has two main effects in these areas, like aggregated here. So you have uh, more recruitment of dry affiliated species, and this means that they're more adapted to drier conditions and mortality of wet affiliated species, meaning that these wet affiliated species they are less adapted to a drier uh, period than more drought. So this can cause a shift in structure and functionality of the forest in general. And this is already observed and like for the past 40 years, this has uh, been occurring here or now we see that, right? So um, what is the, the, the forest becoming? So this is also something Erica raised in a way, right? Not only in structure, but also in functionality in terms of the fluxes and the carbon storage it has. And we already saw, not here, we saw that there are no measurements in Southern Amazon, but we saw in Southern Amazon and very recently that um, an aggregated effect of deforestation, rainfall temperature in the dry season again, and excluding fire events here, we saw that South, uh, Southeastern Amazon is becoming a carbon source. 
And this is quite something, right? Because in general, it's supposed to be a carbon um, sink. So in southeastern Amazon, we also see differences and changes occurring uh, because of climate uh, changes in the region. So the question is, how will Amazonian forest respond? And what would be the potential trajectories and new configurations of the forest, right? So just a little bit of the theory behind tipping points and feedback, which um, are tools that I currently use to really evaluate uh, responses or answers to these two questions here. Um, in general, and I'm very sorry because this is supposed to be one step at a time, but here we go. So in here, we have the ecosystem state and the Amazon forest. So the state of the Amazon forest and in, in here we have conditions, right? And so the response of the Amazon could be linear. So if I decrease precipitation, I have less forest, for example. So this is one way. The other way is non-linear like this one. So if I decrease precipitation, it changes, but it doesn't change like at the same pace with the same rate. So it could be uh, more ab abrupt than gradual uh, response. And in third, I have a more nonlinear with two points here that I call tipping points, F1 and F2. And this is clearly different than this, like more in a mass, right? And a sigmoid, a strong S. And what this means is that for a certain range of conditions here, two states can occur, so forest and something else down here, right? And this could be triggered if you cross the tipping point and through feedback mechanisms, you go down or you go up. And why is it so irreversible, as people say, right? Because if you drop here, like very non-linearly, to go back here and up, it's almost impossible to happen. But theoretically, you could reverse what occurred, like um, because of deforestation or um, decreasing rainfall. You could go back, but it's very hard and very unlikely to occur. So it's, that's why it's kind of irreversible. And then if you have this sort of behavior here in uh, forest response, then you can, you can have two types of disturbances. You can have change in conditions, which is more or less what climate change gives you, right? Um, climate change in general, but like regional climate in the Amazon. Then we can have like crossing a tipping point in here and down and crossing a tipping point here and back. No, this, this one is very unlikely, but you could in, in general. And, because of human activities, you can cross a tipping point indirectly. So you don't really cross it, but because you decrease the amount of forest, for example, right? So you disturb the, the, the forest here, you decrease the amount of forest. So you cross this path here of instability. And then you can, because of feedback mechanisms, and Erica already said a little bit about this, you can go down here to another configuration. So this, just to show you that tipping points are these points here, very hard to really quantify because as you saw, the system is very complex, right? So um, we try to do that each step of the way, so conditions like rainfall, but it's hard because then you have soil, you have interactions with human activities. So it's a complex, um, system full of interactions and it's really hard to really quantify to this point but still we try right so I'm going to show you uh, three examples of tipping points and the values and the quantification we have and the feedback um, they are associated to so first here is a global warming in general so two is a big picture of the world so two to five degrees Celsius and how this global warming can affect regional climate in the Amazon and cause a feedback. So just bear uh, in mind that this is a lot of arrows, but uh, keep track with me, okay? So global climate change 
And the regional climate response will be severe rainfall reduction. We saw that in Ericas and also um, uh, in here as well, in dry season intensification and length. And then if it's less severe, right? You can change the forest, but without a dieback, depending on how the forest will respond to increasing CO2. And more severe rainfall reduction, a total forest dieback. This is what models tell, tell us. So it's just a modeling exercise um, we see for the Amazon. And then the forest dying back, you reduce evapotranspiration, and then you change even more the regional response, um, sorry, the regional climate within the Amazon, right? So you have here a cycle and a feedback loop that can reinforce global climate change, right? In, in, in other, in, sorry, in um, another pathway here, you can have um, a change without the dieback, but then you increase CO2 emissions and reinforce global climate change as well. So it's a, um, a chain of interactions that can fit back into the regional disturbance or the first disturbance that, um, in here and change uh, the regional climate, the Amazon, and create a new equilibrium here. So this has been done like since the early 2000s and we see um, people say uh, in ecology that I'm, I'm constantly talking to ecologists, they say that this um, will not happen, it will not happen in the Amazon, but uh, other things can happen, right? So the forest dieback per se is not likely, but what's gonna happen? And then if we go, and we don't know exactly the answer yet, uh, but we know that if you zoom in a little bit and you see in a more regional scale like this, not the forest as a big leaf or one type of the forest, only, and Erica pointed that out uh, in terms of the disturbances, we see that we can have tipping points in rainfall and the fire feedback. So if you include fires, and if you increase the frequency and intensity of fires, and as Erica said, fires is not within the forest like naturally. So you could um, cross the tipping point, and the tipping point would be like uh, 1300 millimeters a year of rainfall. And if you cross that, you can turn into a savanna, right? But there is a range of conditions here that savannas and tropical forests could occur. And savannas here are like a natural ecosystem, but not necessarily will turn into a savanna, savanna, but a more degraded ecosystem, right? So if it, you don't have fires, you allow canopy formation and fires become rarer and weaker. And if you have like less or more fires, uh, woody cover will be limited by fire frequency. So this is another feedback here that reinforces uh, changes in rainfall rate in the large scale to the regional scale. And um, the last one I'm going to show you is this um, tipping point related to deforestation. The 20, 25 percent of deforestation could lead to a dieback and a savannization of the entire forest. And how does it work? So this is the tipping point and the feedback, the evapotranspiration feedback is related to the recycled rainfall we have. And Erica mentioned 25 to 50% recycled rainfall, right? So if you have like a forest, you have evapotranspiration in a certain rate and this um, fits rainfall and rainfall falls, you have the forest and then you recycle this rainfall. On the other hand, if you um, log and cut off forest, the evapotranspiration decreases and then the rainfall decreases. So you reinforce the first disturbance, which is deforestation. So less rainfall, less um, um, forest cover, and less evapotranspiration. And this goes to another ex equilibrium. Uh, it's a dynamic equilibrium, though, but uh, equilibrium, right? 
Could I just and jump so into these, the of Marina, if you could, would this be a good okay. place to break and we can save some of the issues for the, yeah, for the Q&A because it's fascinating. Okay. Okay. I'm afraid if you go too quickly, we won't absorb it and, and time will go by. Is there, would you like I'm to just- sorry, okay, I'll go. No, sorry, so, nothing. Um, but if you could maybe make a <laughs> wrap up, wrap so, up comment, we'd appreciate okay. it. Okay, thank you. So two slides, the potential trajectories, where are we, are we heading to, right? So if we think about wildfires, one thing, one configuration we see is potential like less biodiverse savannas, especially in, in white sand soils within the Amazon. If you have disturbances like deforestation and wildfires, you would have an open canopy degraded um, cover and land use deforestation and wildfires a closed canopy degraded secondary forest. This is a possible and potential pathway to uh, forest cover. And just to finish, uh, we have lots of uncertainties and heterogeneities, but are we going to wait and see or take action? Because the planet can really go to a hothouse earth um, state in general, and this depends highly on the biosphere degradation we have here and the stewardship we, we, we give to the planet. So we can have a stabilized earth or a hot house earth, depending on how we decided to go to human emissions and biosphere degradation. And then this is the question for you, wait and see or take action. And I'm really sorry about the technical issues and the time for that. No, it's just terrific. I I think we all know the answer to the question. If you ask politicians, are they going to wait and see or take action? We know how they're going to respond. But it's sort of like up to the rest of us to make sure they don't respond uh, in that way, as all three of you have very, I think, movingly uh, uh, argued. It's almost a matter, as a nine scientist myself, a matter of getting what you're telling us out into the uh, public sphere in ways that are more easily, how to say it, digested by the non-specialist. But they have to be understood. You know, the implications of what you're saying just have to be understood. And this finishing up on this dramatic point of tipping points, even though you you said many times, well, we're not quite sure. It still has to be quantified. A lot of things could happen. That that in itself becomes an excuse for an action. Whereas the proper action is let's study it some more and let's talk about it some more. And let's not just assume it might not it might not happen. But anyway, I. I I really, really appreciate it. We're at the part of the program where I'm supposed to summarize what the three of you said, but I can't do that for many reasons, including that it was just too vast, an area you all three covered and that wouldn't be fair to you. So let's move, let's move to the questions. I just like a quick word to the speakers. We're gonna hear one question on screen. My colleague, Gail Lynch is back with us. She'll introduce our student questioner uh, and uh, then that'll be question thrown briefly to all of you. And then I'd like our speakers while they're maybe not speaking and answering the question, uh, glance over the list of questions you've already received, pick the one or two that you think is most relevant uh, and, and uh, feel free. I'll ask you to pick the question and, and provide your answer. But Gail, uh, please uh, welcome back, Gail, and uh, please introduce our student uh, uh, questioner. Sure, so my name is Gail Lynch and I'm the program director for the Global Columbia Collaboratory. And we have been working with our students um, each week as we do our global seminars. So we have a student who has a question she'd like to ask of our panelists. It's Victoire Mandonad, and she's an anthropology and economics major with academics or academic interests ranging from nuclear studies to more financially related topics. Victoire is also involved in the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement at Columbia University with our Global Scholars Program this summer in French Polynesia that is focusing on nuclear um, weapons and nuclear testing. And in her spare time, she is involved in the arts and competing in triathlons. So without further ado, Victoire, why don't you ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you, Gail, for introducing me and thank you for all the panelists to come here uh, for us and for the people who's gonna watch you later. So uh, as I was reading all the Amazon we want, uh, I was surprised by like a definition of uh, health as um, a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. And like maybe like Erica, like um, when you say like um, forest degradation as the outcome of a disturbance, like I felt like in this definition there was something like so absolute. And um, thinking of like um, the Human Development Index, um, with regard to the uh, GDP, I was thinking like, oh, like what would be like today like um, an updated version of um, the definition of health that we consider more 
the social ideas of progress we had made on the topic. And then I was, so this is what's kind of my, my question. And uh, within that, I was wondering like how like the Amazon, like if the Amazon people like had come with an initiative of this kind and where it would be, or otherwise if you had ideas on the question, how would it look like today? Thank you. Can, can I ask you just to repeat the, the, the end? What, what would you like, what, what, sorry? So like if um, the definition of health was like a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. And I was wondering like, uh, comparing the H, the human development index and the GDP, like how would be like an updated uh, definition of health to consider the stake of today? Interesting question uh, uh, as far as raising it. it. It's equivalent of an HDI, human development index for the Amazon focusing on health. And what would that show us if we really took the social reality, right, Victoire, of the Amazon into account and, and try to look at human development from a health perspective? Do we know anything about that? Uh, what, what can we say about this, Susanna? Yeah, well, I, I think it's an interesting question. I think also, you know, Amazonia is not just for people. In a certain sense, um, what we always are, and I teach in a planning school, in a policy school, um, is that mostly these, these um, uh, indices, GDP and human development index are a historical, they're abiotic and they're anthropocentric. And the thing is, you cannot solve this question by just saying, well, if, if we come up with better, with better issues, with better framings of these things, somehow we'll get a better health outcome. First of all, the other thing is that we have to understand that there are nine countries with a lot of Amazonian territory and quite different politics within them, although all focused on how they can extract wealth from this area and not particularly put any back. The other thing is the problem of environmental externalities, which is the GDP in these areas do not count the costs of, particularly the costs of the environmental uh, uh, degradation that's going along with this. So if we're going to do this, it's not just that you lose a billion dollars a year in your crop output. It's if you really wanted to do the environmental costs, you'd have to sort of figure out what would be the cost of irrigating the entire Amazon up to the level that is currently being uh, washed in water? What are the environmental costs of lost species and lost habitats? There's lots of other things. What are the environmental effects of these conversions in terms of um, microorganisms and emergent diseases and so on? So there's a lot of other questions. So one is that I don't look at the human development index that much. Um, one is that it's really great that there's more clean water than at other perhaps moments in time. But if you look at Amazonian urban systems, they're just a mess. They don't really have the human development index as it's reported in the UN is kind of off because it's not picking up a huge amount of the populations in these things. Also, it's useful that there is more education than there was and that these countries overall have higher GDPs than they used to, but it, they also have higher levels of inequality than they used to have, um, in part because populations also relied much more on environmental services as part of their, how shall we say, survival and livelihood portfolios. So I think that the question is needs to be framed um, not just anthropocentrically, but in terms of much broader environmental questions. And that also means really paying attention to the external costs, the externalities, the social costs, which are extremely high and are not being picked up. Um, and also, how are you discounting the future in this model? So that's my answer. Thank you, uh, Erica? Very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Erica. You'd like to add uh, anything to it, Marina? Marina? Oh, Erica, you say, okay. You're okay, yeah, it was a very comprehensive uh, Marina? Okay, yeah. thank you. Victoire, is that hopefully that answers your very your, your, your question. 
um, linking it to health matters, emergent diseases, and I want to thank you very much for, for being on screen. Please stay where you are, and we'll we'll turn to some more general questions. I, I asked each of the panelists uh, um, uh, to, to look over the list, and, and, and I said I'd be quiet, but I'm going to make an exception to the, and ask just a general question. I think a lot of the students are very concerned about indigenous knowledge. There are two different branches of questions. One is, look, you've done this wonderful work. Uh, how does it get into the policy mix? How does it influence politics? Um, uh, and, and what real, you know, how do you think about that as scientist? Do you feel like you've done your work, you've published it, uh, you know, you go back to teaching in the classroom and, and the research labs and, you, and so forth, or do you have specific plans to, you and, and many others who share your values and your concerns and your research to get this into the into the public sphere. So I just maybe throw that question out there. I mean, you know, what differences is all? It's kind of Marina's question, right? What differences is all, uh, all this research and knowledge going to do if nobody acts upon it until it's too late? Which is probably the default. Does uh, that make sense, Erica? Could you maybe take a stab? A number of students have asking about uh, asking about this. <laughs> I think it's a really important question, especially when we have two scientists here from the Global South, which is Marina and myself, even though I'm based in Oxford, um, because that question kind of implies that we have the burden of actually changing um, a whole system when, in fact, we are ill-funded and we have way more teaching hours than our partners in the Global North. So just, to, I mean, Marina can go about how many hours she teaches every week, which I think is around 20 on the contract, isn't it? And then here in the UK, people teach 20 a semester. So yes. how do you find time plus all the students that, of course, um, <clears throat> In both countries, you know, in both the global north and the global south, sorry, we we all have to um, provide adequate supervision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what I'm trying to get to is that although I think this question is super important, and I interact a lot of policymakers and do a lot of policy briefs, I think we need to be very careful when posing those questions, especially for people based on the global south, because they are. Um, resources are much more reduced in terms of being able to produce policy briefs. And their time is actually very different than colleagues in the global north. So, um, and bureaucracy is also a different aspect that we spend a long time dealing with it. Um, as someone that works heavily on the field, I think it's really important also to highlight that to keep those permanent forest plots that I was showing the results, that requires a lot of work that doesn't come on nature papers. And that involves having coffee with people for hours to then eventually get authorization to research a plot because those plots are in private lands. And to keep those relationships, we keep producing material of scientific dissemination, which is from a different group, are for locals, are not for policymakers. And how me as a biologist have the knowledge to communicate to this very different audience from people that are illiterate to people that are running environmental agencies at the local, state, and national level. So I think it's a very important question, but we need to put these nuances there because I just came recently from a conference that um, postdocs were freaking out on not being able to publish in nature and also influence the president. We yeah. don't have the toolkit to do all this and we need help. We need to work uh, collaborations, work from people from different areas that have those abilities and then just by working networks is that we can actually spread the work and not carry out the burden by ourselves. I didn't mean to play there because it's a, a wonderful answer. I wonder, Marina, before you answer this headline in this morning's o Globo, the major, one of the major newspapers here in Brazil, that the science budget has been literally zeroed out uh, in, in this an election year in Brazil. Scientific research, that can kind of sort of wait because uh, we got an election to take care of. But the, the dramatic situation that Susanna Hecht in her presentation made about uh, the anti-science bias, the change in the social and, and economic uh, uh, protections for the forest. How is that affecting science, the type of science that you do uh, in, uh, in Brazil? You don't have the resources to do it and you're under political pressures not to, not to publish or how, how, would you, how do you respond to the present environment in Brazil? Um. 
Yeah, I was just inhaling and exhaling here very deeply, <laughs> as Erica was saying there, because it's yeah, and it's really hard not to really, you know, pour out all the frustration we are facing now in Brazil. So I'm gonna try not to do that, uh, but it's really hard. This is my first answer. Really, really hard because it's not only about money. It's about this the you know, the environment you live in. So everybody's so frustrated and so disappointed and so everything down that eventually you get caught on that, even though you have a little bit of money to do something. And I happen to have that, you know, because I'm funded by a private funding agency in Brazil, I think the only one. Because different from the US, for example, we don't have subsidies based on philanthropy. So this is, we don't have a law that says that you pay less taxes because you give money for science. This is something we don't have. So if people want to give away money to you, they, they do it because they believe you. And that's very hard because they want to make, make money anyway. So, and they spend less money, right? In the end, it's the demand. So for me, it's still possible, Tom. So answering your question, is it still possible because I have a little bit, but it's not only about me, it's about the environment I'm in and, and how I interact to people who really don't have any resources to do science, right? So they're very demotivated. And also the graduate students, the undergrad students, they're not going to college anymore. So the rate of, of like enrollment in the exams to get into the university, they they fell like drastically in the past five years. So they're too demotivated. It's easier to be a social influencer, for example. Um, and you make more money, you know? No, I'm serious and I'm not really, I, I think it's great if you feel like doing that. So this is a scenario that you, like new jobs are coming out, you know, new types of jobs. And I think in Brazil, people were really getting into that. I, I, I've seen that, my, my, you know, my, my personal view of all this. So I, it's hard to get like grad people to do um, like PhDs and master thesis. It's too much work. <laughs> it's rather, yeah, it's better just to do all this stuff, you know, and make more money because it's so, yeah. um, so little money that you make when you are you, you can barely pay your rent so this yeah. is this the status for us now it, it's it's really true so for me i think i'm fortunate here so i'm just saying that i can do stuff and i'm doing stuff but it's really hard to be in an environment that people cannot do and they don't have the motivation to do that and they don't have like places to work after they finish their phd it's really really hard um and um regarding the outreach I think uh, we need help. Uh, science, scientists just need help. And I think the collab is a, it would be a great um, way of really putting out there and announcing things that are important and misconceptions, right? There, there was a question about misconceptions and things that we can really uh, put out there and reach out to people interested and not interested and gain the, the visibility we need, especially in Brazil, because people don't really know the Amazon, especially in Brazil. People know the Amazon more abroad than in Brazil, right. and they don't connect. They are totally disconnected from the Amazon, especially in southern Brazil, where I live. So it's another country, another world. Internal and colony. lots of prejudice. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Great. It's fascinating. I know I'm, I'm really itching in my time. And Gail, I wanted you to have the final word today. But before we do, Gail and, and, and colleagues, if you can just hang in there just a little bit more. There's a lot of questions. Maybe Suzanne, I'll direct it first to you, but invite a quick comment uh, from each other two speakers. And I apologize for going over some of your obligations to attend to, and I'll, I'll well, be mindful of your time. And, and Suzanne, the general question is changing the economic model, but more humanly uh, involving indigenous peoples and communities as we do so. Uh, the students ask a lot of questions about that. Uh, you know, what do we do with indigenous knowledge? How do we make sure that whatever changes are done to protect the forest and aquatic systems don't make things worse for the indigenous communities that are in the region? This, and big, huge question, I know, Susanna, but even a small comment from you now, 
and then for Marina and Eric, I think would be enlightening for us all. Involvement of indigenous communities and in, in this change that we must see in the Amazon, in Amazon policies. Well, I think the central problem that we have right now is the indigenous politics are pretty terrible. Um, and the issue of sort of overriding the, um, the, the protected area status, the uh, autonomy of indigenous people. And also in many ways, I would say a kind of under recognition of both the numbers of indigenous people when we look at Quilombos and stuff, we don't demand that everybody has a pure African descendant uh, blood type. We look at the sort of blended populations. We know that there are huge populations of that uh, of rural rural peasants of many types that incorporate a lot of indigenous knowledge in their in their yeah. systems, and that also the Andean countries in many ways are in. Uh, 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 majoritarian indigenous populations. So one of the things is to maybe get over this idea that uh, indigenous populations in Amazonia are some like kind of little sprinkling. Uh, there are clear ethnicities, but there's also a lot of not so specific ethnicities that also are shaping these places that have traditions and that have also knowledge systems. So that's one thing, which is, um, to rethink what we mean by indigenous. And the other thing is that essentially what's gone on is that the issues of autonomy and indigenous citizenship are rapidly being eroded. So if it's not just a matter of a technical thing of somehow coming up with um, you know, using indigenous knowledge to cure cancer or whatever it is. This has been going, going on for at least 30 years. The problem is that there are the issues of uh, patent rights, um, distributional rights, um, uh, capture. Uh, the case of ayahuasca is actually a, a rather interesting one, which is now that this it moves into, I don't know, fashionable, fashionable circles. Um, so the other thing is that if you look at the number of domesticates that people use that come from Amazonia, let's just take uh, acai, vanilla, and chocolate, um, you can do things with those products and you don't necessarily send uh, uh, an honorarium, a royalty back to uh, indigenous populations in Amazonia. If I want to use soybean, I pay a royalty to Monsanto and Bayer. So what we have is uh, an open commons on indigenous knowledge and a privatization of that knowledge within the current context. Excellent, excellent. Briefly, I'm sorry, Eric, for pressuring you and Marina, but Erica, any final comments from you on, on, the, on this particular issue or anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Sorry, I have, it's, it's end of the day, so they're cleaning here, so there's a <laughs> vacuum cleaner, I'm really sorry. Um, um, I think that um, the question was about indigenous populations, economic alternatives, but I think in terms of economic alternatives, we actually need to think about other people, the people that are on the ground and that are not indigenous and not traditional populations, but are poor, living in the neighbor centers or in rural areas and end up being exploited by this extract, extractive um, economy in different manners. Like for example, working as illegal gold miners. Bear in mind that gold mining used to be something that was very small scale. Nowadays it's not, it's really expensive yeah. to own the tools, the machines to conduct, to conduct the gold mining. But the workers that are working for the owner of the balsa are the ones that actually are extremely exploited, extremely poor. And that has been the case throughout the history of colonization in the Amazon by non-indigenous people, is that always someone being severely exploited. And I think that's those people were the ones that need an, uh, an uh, economic alternative because they are the poor. The people that live in the forest, they're not poor. They just don't abide by our metrics, which goes back to the question before, by our metrics of wealth. But as I heard, just to finish, as I heard from uh, an indigenous woman in a reserve once was, she said, 
I don't understand these people in the cities. They pay for everything. You cannot eat. You need to pay if you want some food. I just don't understand that. While here, I have everything for free. So why am I poor if I don't have to pay for anything, if I don't need money? And I thought that was a really interesting question. So our own metrics of poverty don't make sense for the forest people. And we need to consider the non-forest people that are poor, don't have alternatives. Those are the ones that are actually being exploited, but also vilified in this, in this massive extractive um, economy. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, very much. And Marina, just a final comment from you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to really compliment what Susanna and Erica already said. Um, basically, for me, we do not necessarily know what they need, you know. This is the thing. Um, and they have so much to teach us. And, and it's just to, uh, it has to be a connection among worlds so we can really exchange information. For me, talking to indigenous people is just a lesson, it's always a lesson about what we can do because they've been living in this place for, for, for like forever, like in, in a long, long time. So they know what they need and they know what to do. We just have to listen to them. And we have to really raise awareness uh, on what they need and the, the knowledge they have. And if they need something, I think it's stopping the first patients and, and leaving them living their life, you know, something like that. But it's, it's like an ongoing process. Just listen. We don't listen. We, we want to do stuff all the time. We do, do, do. We don't listen. We have to listen. I'm That's sure it. we'll be surprised at what they tell us too, right, Marina? I, and I thought it's very, very... Uh, For me, it's always a wonder. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But thank you all so much on behalf of the moderation. I'm hearing over to our real host today, Gail. Gail, uh, maybe tell us uh, any wrap-up comments from you, and then maybe when the next session will be, and I hope everybody online today will stay with us a little bit longer uh, than, uh, than you'd planned. Uh, thank you very much for your presence and support. And keep this going, you know, it takes a village to solve, to even begin to understand these problems, much less solve them. So let's, let's, keep, let's keep that village uh, together and, and growing. Thank you very much, Gail. I'll turn it yeah. over to you. Um, just thanks so much to the panelists for spending your time with us, um, especially for, our, thank you to our students who are, if they're not here, they're watching afterward and they're very involved and engaged in the material and that there is I think it's a very hopeful program that we have 48 students who are learning about the Amazon we want and helping to get this information out. And, you know, little by little, I think, I mean, the, the issues are, are, you know, ginormous as we've heard today and very complex, but, um, you know, it's about sharing the information and making sure it gets spread and, and just helping our students um, learn more about it. And so thank you again to the panelists, to the students, to all the, the um, participants who joined us as well. And so I just want to remind everyone that our last uh, seminar is going to focus on uh, uh, solutions and finding sustainable pathways for the Amazon. This will be on July 7th uh, from 10 a.m. Eastern um, Daylight Time. We will also have uh, the Portuguese trans simultaneous translation at that session as well. So please, um, if you've signed up for all of them, you're signed up for that one as well. Otherwise, uh, you know, be sure to sign up. So thank you again so much. Thank you for Tom for hosting and for our panelists.